Hello, Computer Mouse Conference attendees, maybe some viewers of the coding train, I don't know. Uh, why are you watching this video? I'm gonna try something new. I would like to invite the Computer Mouse to be with me out here in the garden with my desktop. I just realized I forgot my train whistle, but let's take a trip, you and me, and explore what it means to learn with the mouse. So where do I wanna begin? 40 years ago, a man named Douglas Engelbart created what he called the XY position indicator for a display system, or more commonly as we know it today, the computer mouse. He presented it in what is famously known as the mother of all demos, and so much of what we take for granted today, every time we interface with technology can be traced back to this original demo. Perhaps a little bit less known was that a few weeks before Engelbart's mouse was demoed to the public, the German company Telefunken presented the first official device that displaced a cursor on a monitor. This invention was called a roll kugel. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that directly translates to rolling ball. And it is just the cutest, most delightful rolling ball I have ever seen. Over the decades, the mouse has changed fundamentally in terms of its design, in terms of how we, the human beings here in the world, use the mouse and interface with our computers. And here I find myself today at an actual conference all about the computer mouse itself. Thank you so much, Emma and Ashley, for inviting me. I'm really thrilled to try to do something a little bit out of my comfort zone here. I have a bunch of demos to show, but ultimately I wanna take the question presented by the Computer Mouse Conference itself, the fundamental question of computer mouse scholarship and explore it. What is it exactly that the mouse sees and how does that shape what humans see? Come on, Gloria. Come on. Come on, come on. I want to begin this journey with the image of a mouse itself. You might have seen in the news or on social media lots of examples of this blank does not exist, or perhaps this AI dreams about cats and it'll haunt your nightmares. And you might be wondering, should you be worried? I mean, I'm a little bit scared. I have of nightmares. I don't wanna have nightmares. This blank does not exist typically refers to the concept of synthetic media. And there are lots of different kinds of techniques to generate imagery, but what is grabbing all the headlines today, what you're often hearing about is something called a GAN or Generative Adversarial Network. A GAN is a system of two neural networks. One is known as the generator, the other is the discriminator. The generator is just making images, generate images, 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 images. Maybe it's trying to create images of mice. The discriminator's job is to look at an image made by the generator and compare it to a lineup of images of real mice. This is the training data set, actual photographs of mice from the real world. Only that discriminator doesn't know which is which. It's got to make a determination. If it can guess correctly which one is the fake, the generator has to go back and try again. And it tries again and back and forth. This is the A in GAN adversarial. These two networks are pitted together against each other in a game of cat and mouse, if you will. Early GANs produced fuzzy, low-resolution images, ones that aren't very realistic and to the human eye are quite distinguishable from real images. However, over the years, these synthetic images have become more and more photorealistic. In December 2018, NVIDIA researchers released something called Style GAN, a novel technique for generating images with finer control over the style of the image itself. In 2020, further improvements were made to this model known as StyleGAN 2. And this is where I find a really big challenge. I can't help but get really excited by this technology and think about the possibilities, that sort of like magic output of these pre-trained models and what doors they might open when placed in the hands of artists, creative people, people like who I'm imagining are watching this video right now. However, it is absolutely critical that my enthusiastic sharing of how to generate your own synthetic images be tempered with a really serious look at the harmful, uh, unintended and sometimes r rather unfortunately intended consequences of this kind of technology. You know, machine learning models are making decisions for us impacting our daily lives all the time. There are countless examples of deeply ingrained biases of harm that's being caused. This harm 
disproportionately affects communities of color and other misrepresented identities. Synthetic media is being used on a regular basis to spread misinformation. So here's just one example of a generated Twitter profile pictures of fictional Amazon workers who love working at Amazon, and this was used as, a, as an attempt to prevent the unionization of workers. Still, there is beauty to be found and much to be learned by these AI dreams, as evidenced by a global, diverse array of artists and activists making thoughtful, impactful work with the new technology. These synthetic artifacts can help us to dream and see the small beauties of life. Take a, a, as an example Helena Sarin's leaves, which showcase intricate outputs of a model trained on the colorful leaves fallen in her backyard. Others, like Dr. Netris R. Gaskins, use a related technique called style transfer to generate portraiture, drawing inspiration from other generative techniques and treating the imagery with neural networks. These are beautiful examples, but AI dreams are often just so ridiculous that they can also bring uh, laughter and levity to our day. Take, for example, This Foot Does Not Exist by the collective MSCHF, as well as Bivalent Friends, created by Golan Levin and Ling Dong Huang. So who am I to just make some absurd style gan mice? I don't know, but it's my hope that if I share this technique with you, the creative and beautiful people of the world, you can educate others, spread awareness, share your artistic vision, and affect positive change. So here's how I trained my own style gan mice to simulate the machine dreaming of the computer mouse. And to be clear, there's no actual dreaming going on here. Machine learning, these AI dreams really boil down to just numbers and spreadsheets, and those spreadsheets being, you know, multiplied together a lot of times. I began by first collecting a data set of mouse images. So I scraped from Flickr, I scraped from Google Images, and honestly, I just, I took a lot of pictures of mice. I've been buying some off eBay, making a collection, and just taking lots of pictures of them from multiple angles. Using Runway ML, I uploaded the entire data set to their servers and started the training process. Runway makes this process of training a StyleGAN model easy. So first, it's got a cloud server that just has all the configuration set up for you. So all of the time that you might be configuring your environment and setting settings and trying to like get your machine learning GPU system to not throw an error, Runway handles all of that for you. But even better than that, Runway has a set of base models from which to train. So it would be, you need a much larger data set and much more time to train a style GAN model from scratch. But in this case, I started from one trained on objects, mostly cars. And so without starting from nothing, I've got my synthetic mice in no time, really just about an hour. Once the training is complete, I can execute the model in Runway itself and browse what is known as the latent space. So the latent space refers to the universe of all possible dreams the model might have about these mice. It's essentially a really, really, really big graph in many, many dimensions. When you see a dreamlike sequence of morphing synthetic imagery, what you are really seeing is a walk through that latent space. Anna Riddler's Mosaic Virus is a wonderful example of a walk through a latent space of beautiful flowers. What's interesting is how you choose to make that walk. And in Anna Riddler's piece, that walk is directed by the price of Bitcoin. Runway ML also has a feature where you can host the model that you've trained. So once I've hosted it, I can then write my own program to request images, and I can make the walk happen however I want. What I chose to do was program a node server that would request these images and then a processing sketch that would ask the node server to request the images. And the reason why I wanted to use processing is I love this algorithm called Open Simplex Noise. It's a wonderful way to smoothly navigate the latent space. And by calculating the noise in processing, sending the results to node, node getting the image from the server, then back to processing, I'm able to render what I'm about to present to you, my short film entitled Computer Mouse Dreams. And uh, just in case you know, I did throw in a couple real mice in there, so hopefully this is not gonna haunt your nightmares. Sorry! And there we have it, cat versus mouse. Score one for the mouse. But I think I might have jumped ahead, maybe done this out of order. Here I am using generative adversarial networks, two neural networks pitted against each other in a fiery battle to generate synthetic mice. Let's take a step back. What is machine learning? What is a neural network? And can the computer mouse help us to understand the answer to these questions?
Gloria. Kyle McDonald, in his 2018 Kick Festival talk, Weird Intelligence, defines machine learning as programming with examples, not instructions. So what does this mean exactly? Programming with instructions is like me attempting to explain and provide instructions to my children on how to do something. Code works the same way, only it requires a highly formal and very specific syntax. And generally speaking, code tends to listen to me. Here's a beginner example from my tutorials on conditional logic. This is something that you learn the f in the first couple weeks of learning to code. If the mouse's X position is on the right-hand side of the canvas, or greater than 200 pixels, draw a red background. Else, or otherwise, if it's on the left-hand side, less than 200 pixels, draw a blue background. Programming by example works differently. Instead of you, the programmer, writing the explicit instructions, you show examples to the machine itself and say, hey, why don't you, based on these examples, learn what those instructions should be to reproduce what I'm showing you. But I can't just show the machine something. In the case of machine learning, what I really mean is take a data set of examples of inputs paired with outputs and feed those into a particular algorithm so that the machine learning system can learn the instructions to reproduce those same outputs with those inputs. A collection of example inputs and outputs is what is known as a training data set. And probably one of the most famous, well-known training data sets for machine learning is something called MNIST, or Modified National Institute of Standards and Technology Database, a large database of handwritten digits that is commonly used for training various, I don't have the next page, <laughs> training various image processing systems. Personally, I'm a fan of a, a twist on that. There's a data set called Fashion MNIST, which is an alternative database. It has 60,000 example images of shirts and pants and shoes and more, all paired with a label. So if I want to demonstrate image classification, I can show a machine learning system, here's all of these Fashion MNIST examples, here's what their labels are. Now, could you go look at some real clothes and correctly classify them? But what is the algorithm that we're giving these examples to? While there are many machine learning algorithms, and sometimes these are called recipes, the N in StyleGAN stands for network, or more specifically, artificial neural network, a computational model based on the brain and probably what is the most popular machine learning recipe being used in today's modern so-called AI systems. <laughs> oh, I caught it, that was really good. Back to the mouse interaction. I've written code, very specific instructions for the computer to follow. Could I reproduce this exact same result, but instead of explicitly writing the instructions, just create a data set examples of what are some points that happen to be on the left-hand side of the canvas versus on the right-hand side of the canvas? I love this example because it's kind of ridiculous. It's very silly and trivial. I'm asking a big, fancy neural network to learn one of the most basic things that uh, a beginner coder learns how to do when learning to program. I find this to be a great entry point into machine learning. I can demonstrate the entire machine learning pipeline, see it from start to finish with something so obvious that it's very easy to test the results and understand all the pieces of what's going on and figure out whether or not it's working. So let's put this into practice. I'll use the ML5.js library built on top of Google's open source machine learning library, TensorFlow.js. It has a neural network object ready to go. First step is to collect the training data. I can write a quick P5.js sketch that collects data through mouse clicks. Click on the right-hand side of the canvas a bunch of times, then on the left-hand side. All the while making sure to pair those clicks with the correct label. Now, it's time for me to configure the ML5.js neural network. I just have two inputs, the X and Y value of each click, and I should note, I don't actually even need the Y value, so that would be another version of this that doesn't bother to use the Y, and one output, a classification that has two discrete possibilities, left or right. Next, I call the train function, and this is what is known as supervised learning. The neural network for each data point makes a guess, left or right, 
If it makes the correct guess, it doesn't have to do anything. Just move on to the next point. If it makes an incorrect guess, there's an error, and it can go back inside of itself and adjust all of its weights and parameters and various internal mechanics to try to get the correct answer the next time. Over and over again, we go. Many, many times through the data. Every time I send all the data, the training data through the neural network, that is one epoch. The amount of times the neural network has gotten things Right or wrong, that's all summarized in what's known as a loss function. The lower the total loss, the fewer the mistakes. The loss is going down during your training. Things are working as planned. Once the model is trained, I can go back to that original if statement, take it out and replace it with sending the x, y position into a neural network and getting the output from that neural network. Same exact thing, this time, neural network classification. The fun thing about this is I can start to play with all different kinds of delineations. I don't have to just look at left versus right. Maybe I look at a circle. Maybe I have sort of like a fuzzy collection of points. And ultimately, the, the question I want to ask of you is, could you reproduce every single mouse interaction we take for granted that is generally programmed with instructions? with machine learning and neural networks. So this is the example I use in my Introduction to Machine Learning for the Arts course in my video tutorial series about ML5.js. I hope that it's helpful. I'd be curious to hear your feedback on how, the, how you imagine teaching machine learning uh, with thinking about programming with instructions and programming with examples. And I also want to give a big thank you to Dr. Rebecca Freebrink. Her work um, building the Weckinator project, another tool for machine learning, and all of her examples of interactive machine learning for design systems was a huge inspiration for these examples and the ML5.js project itself. Now that I've demonstrated how the machine can dream about the mouse, how the machine can be trained by data from the mouse, I want to explore what can the mouse teach us about ourselves, the human beings, and how we use the machine. Physical objects show signs of use over time, wear on a piece of clothing, or a desire path cutting through a patch of grass. Whatever the landscape design says about how to get from point A to point B, we're going to go the most useful and direct way. Technology shows this kind of wear in hardware. F1 keys are sometimes removed, command keys are worn down. Similarly, faded patterns on a mouse pad can give indications on how the mouse itself moves. Where can we see this wear left by our digital presence? The mouse is an extension of the self in the digital space, which is easy to forget. Char Styles in her sketch Nails doesn't let you forget this, as you physically grimace and wince, scratching the mouse as nails across the screen, which has now become a chalkboard. In Maya Man's Can I Go Where You Go, Maya frees us from the limitations of the mouse as agent of the body, and the whole body is able to act and move freely in the digital space. In Do Not Touch by the Amsterdam-based studio Moniker, real-time cursor movements of hundreds of users are collaged into an interactive crowdsourced music video, a collaborative symphony of pointers. I began my own exploration of these ideas by writing a processing sketch to collect mouse data over long periods of time. I was teaching, writing emails, endless and endless and endless Zoom meetings. Creative coding libraries like Processing and P5.js, they have built into them mouse X and mouse Y variables. But you can't actually use these variables. They limit you to the pixels of your graphics display window or canvas themselves. Processing, in case you didn't know, is built, however, on top of the Java programming language. And you have access to all that there is to do with Java itself. And one of Java's classes, it's part of the AWT package, or Abstract Window Toolkit, can both track and control mouse movements in real time across any use of the operating system or any application whatsoever. So I wrote some code to collect and save all of my mouse pointer positions into a CSV file. CSV stands for Comma Separated Values. It's a very standard data format that you can easily reload into all sorts of other things, like a spreadsheet. You can then take this data and visualize it in a myriad of ways. Time-lapse animations, heat maps. I tried a few different ones. 
With all of these mouse movements saved, I could also use them as training data. I can analyze the probability of any moment of the mouse going up, down, left, right, and replay a sequence based on those probabilities with something known as a Markov chain. I could feed this data into something called a recurrent neural network, a kind of neural network that's very well suited for sequential data, time series, text, music vector paths. There's a well-known machine learning model called Sketch RNN that was trained off of the Google QuickDraw dataset to generate doodles of all sorts of different types of things. And I can take the results of that recurrent neural network trained off of my mouse movements to take a nap and let it just take over and control my computer. Now, I didn't include mouse clicks in here, well, although I could have. This way, I just, you know, I'm safe and I'm not gonna end up, you know, who knows what nefarious business, the sort of dream version of my recurrent neural network mouse controller might get itself up to. Thank you so much for spending your time with me at the 2021 Computer Mouse Conference, for indulging me in this experiment. I have learned a lot about what it means to operate a camera, <laughs> frankly, uh, to try to work with a script. And I've really enjoyed having the opportunity to sort of put this uh, set of demos uh, together for you. Um, I've made all the example code from this video available for you. It's at thecodingtrain.com slash mouse learning. And I hope that you find some inspiration to explore dreaming, learning, and teaching with a computer mouse, and that you will share it with me. Thank you to Emma and Ashley and everyone who helped put together the Computer Mouse Conference, and I will see you sometime later. That's my ending. <laughs> Gloria, come here. How did I do? Yes, you, no, 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 no. Yes, you quit talking. Come here. Come here. Yes, you. Come in? No? Wanna come in?